Summer is starting, but one more MJO awaits. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, April 7th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time. No hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. To subscribe, you just hit the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right hand corner of the screen. To like, of course, give us the thumbs up button. And if you have a comment or a question, write that up down below. We'd be happy to reply. And if you'd like to make a small contribution to the cause, you can hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Evolution Moto. Our predicament, Coach Nate, all longtime followers, we really appreciate your contribution. And a new contributor, Jason Dunlap, thank you so much. With that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale in the northwestern Gulf of Alaska, south of the eastern Aleutians, producing 23-foot seas aimed east. This gale was actually stronger when it was over the North Dateline region. We'll get into that in a minute and has produced some swell pushing towards the U.S. West Coast. Other than that, pretty calm pattern is in control. But before we get into that, let's take a quick look at current conditions. We're going to start in Northern California, the Point Reyes buoy, number 029 off of Point Reyes, California. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all the way up to 33 second period, really long period energy, which there is none, down to five second period chop, basically unsurfable uh, wave energy. Where you see bumps is where there is swell. So a little pulse of something at 14 seconds, another little pulse at nine seconds, and of course, uh, pretty good amount of wind swell there. We pick all this together and try to figure out which one is the will produce the largest swell, swell or surf, the integration of swell period and height. And we see primary swell 3.5 feet, 13.5 seconds from 305 degrees. This is energy from a gale previously off of Kamchatka about five days ago. Uh, surf from that, theoretically 4.7 feet, but there's a bunch of wind swell in the water too. 3.6 feet at 10 seconds. You saw that. So there's your 13 second period bump. There's your, says 9.1 here, but we pulled out 10.1 out of that. And so another 3.6 feet of surf on top or intermixed with that. And then the chop height, 3.4 feet from 317 degrees. That's energy from the two to five second period range, just literally pure chop on top. So even without wind sensors on these buoys, you get a pretty good sense that it's blowing, it's ugly, and not particularly good. All right, let's go to Southern California. Go to the Point Loma South buoy off of San Diego, California, number 191. These are the sea dip buoys. And we see sort of the same profile, but of course, well filtered out by the Channel Islands. A little bump out here at 16 seconds and mainly just wind swell. Primary swell, 3.2 feet at 6.5 seconds from 280 degrees. That would make surf at 2.1 feet or, you know, thigh high or something like that. And then some secondary swell in there, 1.8 feet at 9.8 seconds from the same direction. It's probably all just feels the same. Uh, and swell height, 1.7 feet, so knee high. And the chop height, well, not so bad, 1.6 feet. And then finally, over to Hawaii, North Shore, Waimea Bay buoy, number 106. Profile here pretty much just all looks like wind swell. And if I were to take a guess, it's some sort of variant of northeast wind swell. Energy in the nine, seven to nine second period range. Primary swell, 4.9 feet at 8.7 seconds from 29 degrees. Yep, that's northeast. Theoretically, that would make 4.3 foot surf Hawaiian. I guess that'd be chest, chest to shoulder high, maybe maybe a head high peak. I don't know. And then some secondary swell, 1.5 feet at 12 seconds um, uh, from 228 degrees. I think that's more just residual nonsense coming from the the calcula uh, the calculation we used to do this. And the chop height, 2.5 feet. So again, yeah, pretty much pure wind swell. 
All right, let's go back in time. We're going back to Monday, the 1st of April. A gale developed off the Kuril Islands right there. This is the North Pacific with, well, how high are these seas? 26 feet right there. The highest seas over this entire domain at 40 north, 163 east. Yep, that looks about right. Put this into motion. It built to 33 feet on Monday uh, early evening, up to 42.9 feet. In later in the evening and 43.5 feet on Tuesday morning before starting to move over the Aleutian Islands here. So see this right here, this is 40-foot seas. But if it's trying to come east, it's going to slam right into the Aleutian Islands. So that sort of blocks it from what, what, uh, up in here. But some of this energy down here, the 30 to 32-foot seas, probably made it through clear. And, of course, all this stuff back here made it through clear. Yes, it's pushing to the northeast, but sideband energy is rating. And that's actually part of the swell that's hitting right now. It's actually fading in California, and but it's buried in wind swell. So uh, not so impressive. Of another little gale developed there in the Gulf, but anything from that, that's long gone. Now, another gale developed here, right here, starting Friday, so just a couple of days ago, over the North Dateline region with up to 35 foot seas. Part of that shadowed right there by the North, the, the uh, Central Aleutians. But the gale continued to produce, even right there, 30. Six foot seas theoretically, maybe one pixel of 36 feet foot seas aimed off to the east, making it clear of the Aleutians and continuing. Well, let's see, uh, as of the right before uh, last night, sometime Saturday night, 27 foot seas, and then by very early this morning, 25 foot seas and fading, oops, fading from there. So that's where we are right now. Saw from this system bound for the U.S. West Coast about midweek, maybe even some sideband energy, very small, but for the Hawaiian Islands as well. Now, as we teased in the intro, Southern Hemi coming online for sure. A gale developed. This would be uh, Wednesday evening. This one right here. Southern California cuts off at about 118 west. So there. Sw seas 31 feet. Continuing 31 feet on Thursday. Aim pretty well off to the northeast. And then fading as we got into later Thursday night and by Friday, it was all gone. Another system push under New Zealand on Friday. Short little burst of 30-foot seas and pretty much gone. Probably nothing from that. And then here we are on Sunday, new system developing under New Zealand with 33-foot seas fading to 32 feet at about 5 a.m. this morning, California time, and now fading from 28-foot seas or 29-foot seas. So at least two southern hemi swells in route, and when we get to the forecast, you'll see there's more on the way as well. It looks like the southern hemi is taking over. So let's go take a look what's going on in the atmosphere. We're going to start up at jet stream level. We're doing the North Pacific only, but at some point here when it's pretty obvious that the North Pacific is shutting down, then we're going to switch fully over and we'll do the same routine in the Southern Hemisphere only. Right now we're looking at the jet stream. These winds are up about 30,000 feet to help support the formation of gales. And when those gales form, these winds help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, just like you see there, and also right there. All right. What that helps does is create a counterclockwise flow aloft there and there. That is the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, it also manifests itself down at the ocean surface. If the low pressure is deep enough and strong enough, it creates winds on the ocean surface. Those winds impart energy to the ocean in the for in the and create seas. Those raw seas as they radiate away from the fetch area eventually uh, die off and turn into swell. And of course, swell when it hits your beach creates surf. So. So it all starts in the jet stream. Now notice the jet stream is fully split, massively split right here off Japan. When it's consolidated, that tends to do a lot better at digging out troughs. There's more energy in the, the consolidated uh, jet stream path. Uh, but when it's split, it tends to be weaker, not very good at supporting gale formation. This is also an indication of the inactive phase of the MJO, which we'll talk about more later. So for right now, oh, and when you get the split, you typically have high pressure in between. And that's 
pretty much what's going on at the moment. All right, as we get into Monday, now notice that this trough tries to dig out a little bit more here over the northwestern Gulf, uh, the jet pushing into the Pacific Northwest. Look at this, you get a real almost looking trough on Tuesday, but quickly it pinches off. Now the apex of this trough a day ago was supposed to be due north of Hawaii. That would have created swell there, but now you see it's pinched off, basically almost a cutoff low, but it's practically over the date line. So I don't know that this is going to do anything for anyone. Now, here's the interesting part, and this just happened in the past run or two of the models. This low gets completely cut off. Again, probably not going to do much, if anything, for Hawaii, but a new low develops here off of uh, British Columbia. Backdoor trough, classic backdoor trough. This is what happens when you get this super split jet stream over the entire Pacific. It tends to, like, cold air drives it down uh, over the uh, interior U.S. coast, and you can get these backdoor troughs set up that produce, drag cold air and moisture down the California coast. And here you go. You're into Friday. It looks like the jet pushing onshore for uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, low pressure, possibly off the coast, maybe rain and snow. This wasn't here, though we'll say 12 hours ago, so I'd be pretty skeptical of whether this pattern's going to set up, but it looks for like a rainy weekend for at least north and central California a week from now. We'll see if that really happens. Another cut, pinched cutoff trough north of Hawaii as we uh, get in uh, about a week out Sunday, and there we are a week out. So an interesting late season uh, northern hemi pattern. All right, let's go take a look down at the surface, surface level pressure and surface level winds. As expected, the jet is split over this area. There's your double barrel high pressure system. There's a bit of a trough right here. Sure enough, there's weak low pressure, not really doing anything. 30 knot winds supposedly out of the Northwest. And other than that, off the South, high pressure rotates clockwise. So here's your trade winds sweeping over the Hawaiian Islands. Low pressure rotates counterclockwise, that creating your little fetch. The, uh, the gradient, when low pressure is in close proximity to high pressure, that tightens up the isobars, those little lines right there, and that creates wind. So you see that. But anyways, we get into Monday. That all kind of fades out, and it's just sort of a high pressure regime. Now, we know that there is another trough forecast up in here. In fact, you can see... Um, low pressure developing in the Bering Sea. Strong high pressure, 1040 millibars on Wednesday night, the 10th of, oh, and here, then your, your trough, your cutoff low, north, I'm going to say northwest of Hawaii, but it looks like all the fetch is aimed uh, to the southwest, probably not doing anything. Eh, maybe. Hard to say. We'll see how this plays out. Anyway, the low that was in the Bering Sea redevelops falling south theoretically off of California, 35 knot northwest winds. I don't think that's going to do much for surf. It's just more wind, more rain. Actually, look at this, this north fetch here. That's aimed reasonably well at Hawaii. So theoretically, there could be swell for both Hawaii and kind of a windy mess and snow for California as we get into next weekend. That low pushes on shore on Sunday the 14th, and the other low gets push to the north, and that's pretty much the end of that. All right, let's go look at the effect of these winds on the ocean surface. Here we go. We know we have seas up in the uh, uh, northwestern Gulf associated with a previous gale over the North Dateline region. That fades out on Monday. Then everything gets pretty quiet until the new cutoff low starts forming. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. You see 22-foot seas, but they're all aimed down south not directly at Hawaii. We're into Thursday afternoon, and then we're into Friday. We'll pull away again here. The arrows here all suggest the seas pushing more this direction than down at Hawaii. Here comes our new low on Friday, the 12th of April, targeting the U.S. West Coast, 35-foot seas. I mean, maybe if there's some protected break down here, uh, swell could result. Here we are into Saturday. Now, here's when things get interesting relative to Hawaii, because this fetch now takes aim at the Hawaiian Islands, 22, almost 23-foot seas. So 
That would probably be more wind swell, if anything. We'll say 13 second, 12 to 13 second period swell for the Hawaiian Islands. Somewhere into like Monday or Tuesday, that would be the 15th or 16th. The low off of California on Sunday, and it fades out, and there we are a week out. Now, as promised, the Southern Hemi, the slowly i wouldn't i don't want to say star of the show because nothing is really that uh impressive that's going on down here but there is a gale we saw it pushing under new zealand it's fading now with 26 or 27 foot seas but the real interesting thing here is as we get into monday and tuesday remnants of that gale start lifting north and check this out they start building 29 feet also keep your eyes on this guy under uh new zealand here Tuesday evening or midday, we'll say that's 20, 30, 32, 34, 35 foot seas, 35 foot seas, but they're all aimed due north. And on the east side of the blocking uh, to, uh, Tahiti Islands, French Polynesia, all unshadowed relative to California, Central America, most of the fetch aimed up this way. So probably not so much for Peru and Chile. And then continuing, look at that. In fact, let's go back and just look at this whole thing. It just forms, then basically pushes straight north on Tuesday night into Wednesday before it fades out. The other system pushes under New Zealand, but it kind of pushes more southeast. So that's not so interesting yet. But it gets settled down here on Thursday night, the 11th of April, with 37-foot seas. And then watch this. It, start, it too starts lifting northeast, pretty much east of the Hawaiian swell window. 37-foot seas lifting northeast with 35-foot seas and then 33-foot seas. And again, taking that like almost northward track, potentially two back-to-back -back swells for California, Central America, and this also, if it develops, Peru, Chile, both in the game. So we'll see how that works out. And then you see more energy trying to push under New Zealand. So certainly the Southern Hemi becoming dominant, the Northern Hemi still trying, but it's a pretty lame attempt and probably not doing a whole lot. All right, what's the uh, local wind supposed to look like? California here, Hawaii out here, high pressure in control, wind circulate, clock, circulate clock, clockwise around the high pressure, northwest winds, California, well, it's blowing. Yeah, that's more like it. Zero Z, that'd be 5 p.m. It's a, probably a solid 20 knots out of the northwest for anywhere north of Point Conception, just a blown out mess. Trade's pretty much nuking for the Hawaiian Islands. So we get into Monday, the gradient, and this typical springtime sort of pattern, northwest winds upwelling colder water, continues for North California and most of Central California. Trade's a little bit less for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, the pattern backs off relative to California. Lighter wind regime once you get south of Point Arena. Trades 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Not so bad. Get into Wednesday, still the same sort of deal. Yeah, northwest winds 20, 25 knots near Point Arena and up into Cape Mendocino. But once you get south of maybe Point Reyes, a lighter wind regime. Light winds for the Hawaiian Islands. We know the cutoff low is forming out there. Thursday, wind's trying to pick up, wind swell for California. There's your cutoff low, S some sort of south to southeast wind pattern for the Hawaiian Islands, not too strong. And then we get into Friday, lighter wind regime for California as the next low builds. Trades, we'll call them southeast, 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Saturday, here's the south wind event, probably rain and just looks like a mess. Southeast winds for the Hawaiian Islands, 10 to 15 knots. Then we get into Sunday, still a mess for California, and that southeast flow continues for the Hawaiian Islands. We'll run this out. I think it goes out. There we go. And then high pressure comes in for California as the low moves in. Northwest winds right behind it. Light, uh, light trades for the Hawaiian Islands, theoretically, as we get into Monday, the 15th of April. Okay, the rain pattern forecast for California right here. Actually, theoretically, right now, there's supposed to be some light snow for the Sierra. I don't know about that. Maybe. It seems pretty doubtful. It's 
bulletproof, high pressure blue skies, onshore winds in San Francisco right now. We get into Monday, nothing, no rain. I mean, you know, this is typically what happens in spring. Now, again, here comes that low as we get into Friday morning setting up, pushing down the Cape Mendocino coast right off of uh, San Francisco Friday night. Now, here's the deal. When you get these sort of systems, it's, you know, if the low moves 200 miles to the west, no rain for California. If it moves 200 miles to the east, you get exponentially more rain for California. Either way, as we get into Saturday morning, it looks like rain right now for all of, well, light showers for Southern California, rain the whole way up the California coast. Um, oh, there we go. Maybe just Santa Barbara County uh, down further Southern California, unprotected uh, or no precipitation Saturday afternoon, but then sweeping down the whole way down to San Diego for Sunday morning. Uh, Northern California, not so much. And little bits of snow, theoretically, in the Sierra. And then the low pushes onshore over Southern California on Sunday night into early Monday. Snow forecast dashboard for Palisades Tahoe, formerly Squaw Valley. Again, I don't really believe this because it's practically a week out and it just popped up on the model. So it doesn't have like a whole series of runs behind it, but theoretically 13 inches there. Kirkwood with five to maybe seven or eight inches. And Mammoth clocking in with, we'll say maybe seven inches. And then we go here back to Palisades Tahoe. We're going to use this as a sort of a proxy for all of the Lake Tahoe region. Uh, this is the base of uh, Palisades Tahoe, which is also about lake level 6,200 feet. This is the summit granite chief, the Palisades. Uh, red would be temperatures above 35 degrees. The gray here is where you can get sleet from about 35 degrees down to 32 degrees. The white, where the white starts, that's the 32 degree freeze line. And then the 28 degree line, the you know, where you get like really, you know, starting to get solid snow is all the blue. So you can see relatively cold uh, as of the Sunday morning, but then the freeze level went up to about 6,500 feet. By tomorrow morning, it's steadily upward by Monday and into Tuesday morning, your freeze level's up at about 10,500 feet, if not 11,000 feet. And that goes the whole way into the 12th before temperatures start to fall. You get that little window, these yellow lines are just where the precipitation is happening. With the freeze level down below the base, down to about 5,000 feet on the 13th, and then as soon as you get past that, boom, you're right up. So there's maybe one day of, of skiing out of this. By the morning of the 14th, the freeze level's already up above this, you know, nearly to the summit at Squaw. And that's just whatever fresh there is, it'll be already set up before you can even get up the lifts to get to the top of it. And then, of course, the surf forecast will start in Northern California, Ocean Beach, San Francisco, wave heights, well, Look at the winds here, 27 knots. That is as of, uh, you know, later this evening. You see there's surf three to four feet, but when it does this dropout thing, that also means it's pretty much all just wind swell and garbage. Winds finally settle down as we get into Tuesday morning. Surf height, four feet, but dropping. Then starts building as we get into Wednesday into about the six foot range. Winds out of the northwest, 17. I think, so This the way this model works, this, this wind indicator is not pegged like right on the beach. It's a bit off the beach. And some of the, so you got to go look at the high-res local wind models. They tend to look a, a little bit better. And it, there might actually be some waves in there on Wednesday. Anyway, you see the surf just kind of floundering along and you get 30 to 35 knot winds. Even if it's over open waters, it's all out of the south. And this is just a mess beyond that. And that would be for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We go down to San Diego, surf heights in the... Well, theoretically, Monday morning, maybe three foot range. And then after that, it's just, you know, knee high kind of thing until you get into next Sunday. Theoretically, five feet in the wind pattern, not too bad. 
We'll actually go look here at swell heights, 4.5 feet at 12 seconds. That looks okay. The rest of this is one and a half feet at 14 seconds at Southern Hemi Swell. That would be coming in on uh, Wednesday. So from the gale previously down south of California, that's about right. So little southern hemi swell. Don't know how much of this southern hemi swell is really going to be functional in northern California. Maybe Santa Cruz, but uh, for the most part, little southern hemi swell for San Diego, and then some northwest wind swell or westerly wind swells we get into next weekend. And then for Oahu, mainly just easterly trade wind generated swell as we get into Monday, three and a half feet fading into the two foot range and just sort of hanging consistently in the two foot range. Not even sure whether that's really rideable. Swell size is two to three feet at seven to eight seconds. Um, not great, but you know, at this time of year, you take what you can get. All right, let's go take a look long term. Let's see what's going on with the two major oscillations that affect surf and weather long term. The MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, and ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. First, we're going to discuss the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation. It comes in two flavors or two phases, the active phase and the inactive phase. Like I said earlier, the inactive phase, uh, well, let's try it this way. The two phases rotate west to east around the planet on the equator. Active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other. The active phase is the good phase. It's like a low-pressure system. When it moves to the, into the far west Pacific, because it's like a low pressure system, it takes warm, moist air that's down at the ocean surface, lifts it high aloft. That energy gets caught by the jet stream. It energizes the jet stream. It then helps the jet stream to consolidate, making it stronger, more capable of supporting gale formation. And also, uh, it can dampen trade winds, typically when it's in the West Pacific. Uh, the inactive phase does the exact opposite. Also, the either the active or the inactive phase, once it gets into the West Pacific, takes four to six weeks to make its trek across the Pacific. So the active phase will go for four to six weeks crossing the Pacific. Then right after that, the inactive phase will follow. And then right behind that, the active phase. So it's sort of this yin and yang thing that goes on. Um, the active phase manifests itself. Uh, we can see it both the active and in the active phase, using the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator in the Pacific used for monitoring El Nino. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. That's New Guinea there. That's the equator there. 180, that's the date line. So we're just looking at the arrows. These are five-day average winds from the buoys. Pretty strong out of the East, not super strong. So... You know, if it was the inactive phase, trades would be nuking because the inactive phase is like a high pressure system. It splits the jet stream and it enhances trades. The active phase suppresses trades. So, you know, trade winds not super strong. You get over the Central Pacific, they're getting stronger. And over the far West Pacific, we call it the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, really strong. So this sort of looks like inactive phase entering the... Uh, West Pacific and the active phase exiting the East Pacific. But it's not the actual wind speeds, it's the anomalies. Difference from normal for this time of year. If you go here in the far East Pacific, the arrows are pretty weak. I don't see any, well, there's some westerly indications down there, but it's only five degrees north and south of the equator that the active phase really has the biggest impact. So we'll say maybe a light active phase fading out here but then you get over here and i'm not seeing any stronger than normal trades either so almost seems like a neutral pattern let's dig a little deeper this is 850 millibar vector wind anomalies zonal wind anomalies just fancy words for the east west component of the wind if the winds are stronger out of the west associated with the active phase then you see the oranges if they're stronger out of the east in active phase, you see blues. And let's get ourselves oriented. This is And this is for the past five days. So April 1st, South America there, Central America. Zero is the equator. 180 is the date line right there. There's New Guinea there. So we see westerly anomalies on April 1st over the East Pacific. That would be the active phase of the MJO. And these east anomalies here look like the inactive phase pushing in. Same pattern continue. We'll just go five days down later. And... 
April 5th, whatever was left of the active phase looks like it's gone. If anything, it's in the Atlantic, and a weak inactive phase is over the Pacific. That's for the past five days. Let's go look at the forecast. All right, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies from the GFS model. All right, the oranges and reds are the westerly anomalies loosely associated with the active phase of the MJO. Now, this is the whole planet on one chart. So the date line 180 runs right up the middle. The far west Pacific starts about 125 east, so somewhere over here. And this is the area that we're most interested in. That's where when the active phase moves into, I call it the Kelvin wave generation area, the far west Pacific. That's where the active phase does best at pumping energy into the jet stream to support storm formation downstream more over the Easter Pacific. So, all right, so we're basically focusing on the center of the chart. Back in March, we see westerly anomalies, likely the active phase, pushing across the Pacific and then gone. Then the inactive phase started not in the Pacific, but over the Indian Ocean about mid to later March, made its way, well, at, here's today, right smack in the center of the, well, of the West Pacific entering in and the forecast has it tracking through and out of the Kelvin wave generation area by, oh, what's that, about the 15th, so about another week or so of east anomalies. Now, this is really interesting. The GFS is quite strong in this, showing a strong westerly wind burst setting up here in the West Pacific and even westerly winds starting in just a day or two, but getting solid by the 12th. So that's, what, five days from now? And then continuing, you can just see, just pushing the whole way across the Pacific through pretty much the end of April. This is what we alluded to in the title. It is, you know, the at one more push of the active phase. Now, it's the end of April. The seasons are changing. Will it really have any effect in the northern hemisphere, probably not so much, but the active phase also affects the southern hemisphere as well. So maybe this would be a nice red X for the first real pulse of southern hemi storm development. We'll see. All right, so now let's go look at another component of the MJO. It not only affects the winds, but it creates clouds because it's a low pressure system. Taking the active phase of the MJO, low pressure system, takes warm, moist air aloft, lifts it up into the atmosphere where it then condenses. condenses. So this is a forecast of outgoing long wave radiation, OLR, fancy words for cloud cover. Okay, oranges are drier air, no clouds. Inactive phase of the MJO, blues, more clouds, and they call it negative anomalies. That means less sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface because the clouds are there to prevent it from bouncing off. High pressure, active phase of the MJO, cloud-free skies, so everything that hits the ocean reflects back off. All right, and let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, the equator there. Dateline there. All important Kelvin wave generation area right here. Inactive phase of the MJO in control now. Five days from now, active phase starting to move into the West Pacific. Ten days from now, active phase fully in control and fully in control 15 days from now, two weeks from now. This is a statistic model. The dynamic model says basically exactly the same thing. The two models are in sync. This is, again, a good indicator that starting oh, about a week and a half, week to a week and a half from now for two weeks, at least the, the uh, uh, jet stream, be it either in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, might be a little bit better primed to support storm formation and therefore surf production. A drill down of the same two models, statistic model here, dynamic model here. These are phase diagrams. So what this chart represents is where the active phase is and how strong it is. But how do you read the chart? Well, the active phase moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent, that'd be like Bali, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Here is the path of where the active phase was in March. And the further these dots are away from this circle, the stronger they are. So in mid-March, we had a strong, pretty strong active phase working its way through the West Pacific, and then it crashed. Here's where it is right now, the heavy dot, and it's inside the circle. So a very weak active phase today over somewhere moving from the Indian Ocean into the maritime continent. 
three different forecast tracks have it moving almost into the West Pacific two weeks from now. Two of them suggest very weak, one suggests strong. The dynamic model, a little bit more aggressive, suggesting the active phase already like through the Pacific and moving into the Atlantic two weeks from now, but all very weak. We'll see. Upper level model, this is a statistic model suggesting or showing the potential for precipitation. The greens are areas favorable for precipitation. One would say the active phase of the MJO. And the oranges and reds dry air, the inactive phase of the MJO. This runs about a week ahead of what's going on at the surface because this is up at the jet stream level, uh, the 200 millibar level. So this suggests inactive phase already pushing through Central America and the active uh, inactive phase and the active phase moving into the west pacific but pretty weak making its way across the pacific into about middle of april so that's a week ahead so it would be the end of april and then pretty much out of the all important kelvin wave generation area with west uh, the inactive phase and dry air setting up behind that Let's go look at another model, the CFS model, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. Again, the reds are westerly anomalies, the active phase of the MJO, blues, easterly anomalies. And we actually have an in MJO indicator, the black uh, contour here. A dotted contour means inactive phase, so you can see. Dotted contour, inactive phase with the blues, easterly anomalies. Not good for storm production. Oh, and the dateline runs right up the middle. So this is the same deal. West Pacific is where the action is, starting about 125 east to about 170 west. So right down the middle of the picture. Now, this is all past performance. In January into early February, active phase, westerly anomalies during El Nino continued on pretty good into February. Then we got an inactive phase in mid to late February. And then we had our last pretty good active phase in late February through March. And now here's our current inactive phase. Notice the uh, strength of the MJO is getting weaker as we get into summer. And that's not unusual. It seems like the MJO does its best in late fall into about early spring, and then it whittles down. So here we are with our current inactive phase over the West Pacific. Easterly anomalies in control, forecast holding for about another week. But then here comes a... Now the CFS model here, notice here's your active phase and your little bit of westerly anomalies. Definitely not nearly as impressive as the GFS model. I think I'd actually believe the GFS model more than the CFS. I mean, this this has been holding steady for a week now, just showing solid westerly anomalies. So a weak inactive phase, or active phase, and then as we get into the end of April, easterly anomalies and another weak inactive phase setting up. And then finally, the CFS model going out three months, word of caution, hardly believe a model going out a week, much less three months, but you know, it's fun to look. Past performance is down here, the future is up here. Uh, the or This is uh, 850 zone, uh, millibar zonal wind anomalies, and the same deal, Kelvin wave generation area right down the middle. Strong westerly anomalies back in December. That was probably active phase. Here's your easterly anomalies, inactive phase. Then February and late January dominated by active phase of the MJO. Here's your inactive phase. Here's another active phase in latter part of March. Here's our current inactive phase. Now, this is interesting. This just shows pretty much steady westerly anomalies, but they're almost wet, retrograding west with easterly anomalies setting up over California. All right. Oh, California is, yeah, about 120 west, something like that. Let's overlay the MJO and just get a rough idea of what's going on. Sure enough, wherever you have your oranges and yellows, that's where you had this, the solid red contour active phase. The dotted contour is your inactive phase. So here's our current inactive phase here, and it's supposed to last for about another week, and then westerly anomalies start building. Here's our active phase. Now, theoretically, after that, 
Dotted contour in active phase, but westerly anomalies continuing. Don't know about that. Kind of doubt it. Let's overlay the low pass filter. This is your El Nino La Nina indicator. The solid contour is your El Nino indicator. Lower than a low pressure bias, a tendency towards low pressure. And of course, one, two, three, four contours over the date line back in December at the peak of El Nino. We're then faded to three contours. The second contour about ready to fade out in another day or two. We have one remaining contour that's supposed to hang into about the end of May over the date line, and then that will be pretty much the official end of El Nino atmospherically. And notice the low pressure bias moves over, well, this is about 100 east, so this is Indian Ocean, something like that. And you can start to see right there the very beginnings of a high pressure bias starting to set up over California, this is the beginning, per perhaps, of La Nina for uh, the Pacific. What's going on in the ocean now? Okay, we've talked about the MJO and all that. Now we're going to get into the El Nino, La Nina part of the discussion. So we're just going to look at some objective evidence. What's happening in the ocean? We're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, but we're not looking at the atmosphere now. We're looking down in the ocean. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific. But we're looking down 100, 200, 300 meters. So what's that? Nearly 1,000 feet down. And we're looking at temperature gradients in the ocean. How do we do that? Well, here are the actual anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are sensors on those anchor lines. You take the sensors, they give us water temperature in centigrade, and then use a model to fill in the gaps in between the anchors, and you get a profile of what's going on just from uh, like two degrees south to two degrees north, the whole way across the Pacific. We see in the East Pacific, we have a very shallow layer of warm water. It was, was much deeper during El Nino, but already the warm water that characterized El Nino is already gurgled all up to the surface and is getting carried back to the west. You see the bulk of warm water now, the 29 degree isotherm in the far west Pacific and the 28, the 24, and everything here is 25 meters or less, so what's that, about 75 feet, maybe 80 feet uh, down, and after that, it's cooler water. But that's not so much what matters. It is the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year, and you see the picture very clearly. The last little bit of warm water here, and I think some of this, this is one, two, almost three degrees. I think a lot of this this heat here that has nothing to do with El Nino. I think a lot of it might be just that the active phase of the MJO was over here. Trades were lighter than normal, so the sun got to beat down on the ocean surface, warming it up. You see down below, down about eh, 30 or 35 meters, a giant pool of much colder than normal water, one, two, three, four, almost five degrees below normal all working its way off to the east as soon as this warm water and trade winds start building again over the east equatorial pacific this cool water is just going to get is up going to upwell mad to the surface and it will be a clear sign of the development of La Nina. Let's go look at one other version of this. This is data from the TAO buoy array as well, but also enhanced with data from satellites. You see pretty good cool pool here in the East Pacific working its way to the surface. Yes, there are pockets of warm water, but by and large, most of the warm water is getting caught by trades, pushed off to the west. No Kelvin wave productions. I'm not going to get into that now because we, we went through a year of talking about Kelvin waves. That's all done now. If anything, we have a cold water Kelvin wave moving to the east, getting ready to gurgle up to the surface and usher in La Nina. Pentad sea level anomalies. This is the height of the ocean. Let's get ourselves oriented. Chile, Peru. This is the equator right there. That's the date line right there. Uh, Ecuador here, the Galapagos there. Then you have Central America and uh, mainland U.S., Hawaii there. But what only matters is basically five degrees north and south of the equator. 
these numbers, minus 5, minus 10, now minus 15, that is the height of the ocean. That is the sphere of the ocean. You take out the waves, the wind waves, the tides, and is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? Why does that matter? Well, if you have cold water at depth, cold water will contract, and so it'll create a little divot on the ocean's surface above where that cold water is at depth. Likewise, or conversely, if you have warm water at depth, it expands, it'll create a bump on the ocean surface. So what this is saying is in the equatorial Pacific, we're at minus 10, minus 15 centimeter anomalies the whole way across the equatorial Pacific, suggesting colder water at depth, exactly what we saw in the previous images. So just more confirmation that El Nino is dead. And then here's a time ver version of that the West Pacific here, East Pacific here, time going down the side. You can see warm water, Kelvin waves, driven by the active phase of the MJO and westerly anomalies associated with those active phase. The active phase actually drives the production of Kelvin waves, taking warm water that's typically in the West Pacific, pushing it east. So one, two, three, four, five, maybe even six, just Kelvin waves on this and then it all stopped. You see the warm pool was completely tapped out. Even if you had massive active phases of the MJO, there was no warm water at depth to push to the east. And so what you end up with is cold water making its way across the Pacific, poised to erupt to the surface. Now, interestingly enough, we look at sea surface temperature anomalies and it still looks like El Nino for the most part. Here's Chile, Peru, uh, Central America, Mexico, Hawaii out here, the equator right down the middle. Oranges and reds warmer than normal temperatures. Well, we have piles of warm temperatures still over most, most of the uh, equatorial Pacific. A little bit of cool water here along Peru over uh, the Galapagos and trying to build, but not anything particularly like eye-popping yet. We know at depth this whole area here if you go down, what, maybe 35 meters underneath all this, it's nothing but, I, well, I don't want to exaggerate, not ice cold water, but definitely much colder than normal water. But none of it has made it to the surface yet. I think it's just a matter of time. Just this little bit right in here. Anyway, you get the picture. Here is the trend for the past seven days, so you can see that is pretty cold water. It's just a trend. It's not actual water. It's Water is trending colder here just over the Galapagos and off of Ecuador. You see signs of it building the whole way across the equatorial Pacific. Some of this might be the active, the inactive phase of the MJO driving trades here, but I suspect some of it too is just that cold water depth trying to work its way up to the surface. It hadn't fully made it, it hadn't wiped out El Nino's heat yet, but it's get it's going to have its day. And then one more backed off view. Again, quite warm temperatures. Of course, the whole planet is warming. The oceans are warming. Uh, you've heard that. Some of that is uh, climate change. Some of that is probably a lot of uh, um, uh, moisture that was ejected up into the atmosphere by the Tonga volcano two or three years ago. They said they, said they thought of maybe three or four years till all that moisture is wiped out. And then some of this is you know, a lot a lot of this here is due to El Nino, but then you look at the Atlantic and look at how cooking warm here. Uh, climate scientists are very a bit concerned about, they call this the main development region here, that's for tropical cyclones, pushing off of Africa over the uh, Cape Verde Islands and then up into here. If this is where you're going to do your storm development, you got to have warm water to do that. Well, we're not even into summer yet, and it's already definitely warmer than normal. So uh, something to watch out for as we get into the middle of summer. Sea surface temperature anomaly trend. This is in the Nina 1.2 region, so right there by Ecuador and the Galapagos. You see the steadily falling temperatures. This is neutral right here, though still toggling uh, 379 thousandths of a degree above or below normal. I mean, that's not too big of a deal, really. Uh, La Nina doesn't start until you're down at half a degree below, and you got to be there for quite a while. So a temporary trend in the downward direction, though we suspect this is a lot more than temporary. If you go to the official, the, the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, still hovering 
pretty nice at, what is that, 972 thousandths of a degree, basically one degree above normal. Uh, weak El Nino is half a degree to one degree. Moderate El Nino is one degree to one and a half degrees. Strong is one and a half to two. We peaked out somewhere in the right at about two degrees back in I think it was December or something like that, late November. Uh, so still the hangover from El Nino hanging on, but at some point these temperatures are going to start plummeting as well. And another nice graphic, sea surface temperature anomalies over time. This is the West Pacific, the East Pacific here, and that's, let's see, what is that? More, uh, oh, May, June, July, August, September. So this was uh, last uh yeah, last year, you could see the evolution of El Nino, warm water, a result of Kelvin waves traveling subsurface, impacting Ecuador, building, creating a warm pool, filling and peaking over the equatorial Pacific in November, December into about January. And then you see the steady erosion of that warm pool now. There's your first little cool uh, pocket showing up in the general degradation here of sea surface temperature anomalies. No big surprise. So what does the atmosphere think is going on? And this is really kind of weird and interesting. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it kind of does. All right, so we're looking at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and the Indian Ocean, and Tahiti, and the Pacific Ocean. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Okay, minus 8.29. And you go back here and go, what? It's been negative for almost a week here, which is really interesting. And you go, well, is that the active phase of the MJO? And you would think it is, but it probably isn't because let's go back to March 24th, where basically it was neutral. And you see the difference in pressure between Darwin and let me make sure I got this right. Yeah. Between Darwin here at 1,009, almost 1,010 millibars, and Tahiti at almost 1,014, so a 4 millibar difference is neutral. And then you get down here, you see this, but what's happening, I think, is pressure is, it's almost dead even between Tahiti and Darwin. So yes, it's signally negative, but that doesn't mean that pressure is really much lower in Tahiti relative to Darwin. In fact, they're almost on parity, so it skews negative. I don't think this really means anything. Let's go back in time. You can see even in March, when we were still theoretically better in El Nino, we were in the positives here. Not No big deal. The 30-day average, which should have been down at minus 20 and 25, never got there, even at the peak of El Nino. I think it got down to like, you know, maybe minus 15 for a couple of days. And then the 90-day average, the true El Nino-La Nina indicator, which should have been down at minus 15 or 20, even here, never really got below minus 5. So for right now, it looks like we're kind of neutral. In fact, let's go look at a graph. Here's that data graphed out. So back in 22, uh, all positive numbers, La Nina, the third year of La Nina. And then as we got into 23, it started diving down. Active phase, active phase, the MJO drive, it'll pressure lower over Tahiti, driving the index down. But then, I mean, it just didn't stay down. It kind of just was very a weak El Nino, if anything. And we we've talked about this. I'm going to talk about this at some point, the interaction of El Nino and the PDO. And I think the PDO, another even longer term oscillation, just really killed our El Nino. Here's where we are today, basically neutral. Any real signs of El Nino are already fading atmospherically. Sea surface temperature forecast from, from the CFS version 2 model for the Nino 3.4 region. Well, here was our El Nino back in December with two degree above normal temperatures. The current data suggests, and eh, we're down at about 1.3. I think I read some weekly data for, for the past week said we were actually down at about 1 now. Okay. Um, and the forecast has it steadily falling down to really minus 2.2 .2 degrees. Now that's 
an extreme uh, outlier minority report, if you will. Uh, the consensus model has temperatures down, falling down to about one degree. But I think nobody really knows yet. We're in the spring unpredictability barrier, barrier, April and May. The models have a real hard time sensing what's going on. But once we get into the beginning of June, I think the models will have a much better handle. We'll see how deep we won't know how long, because we. but I suspect we're heading towards La Nina. The question is, for how long and how deep? We'll have to wait and see. But right now, El Nino is dead. So for right now, inactive phase of the MJO appears to be in control, but active phase is coming. In the immediate short term in the Northern Hemi, rain for California again? Really? Well, it's springtime. I guess so. It uh, wouldn't be unexpected. Maybe even a little bit of snow. We're at... I went and did a look at all the, you know, snow water equivalents. And uh, in the Sierra, we're about 110% of normal. And this is the peak of the season right now. So we're actually in great shape, hydrologically speaking. And last year, we were 200% or something. All the reservoirs are, for the most part, full. We're in great position that wise. Um, surf wise, from the Northern Hemi, this low coming into California, if it even happens, I, I think it's just going to be a bunch of windswell, a bunch of slop. I mean, maybe there'll be something rideable. Uh, Calif Southern California will probably do better. Hawaii has a shot maybe at some backdoor uh, trough activity, some one more push of northerly swell. But really, the focus now looks like the Southern Hemi. Series of storms forming, two of them looking pretty solid, not huge, but definite uh, Southern Hemi swell projected for California and down into Central and even South America. Watch the models, see, uh, you know, see how this plays out. Of course, we'll update again next week. And longer term, the trend is definitely towards the Southern Hemi. We're going to quit focusing on the Northern Hemi as soon as we're certain that uh, it's done and it's over. But uh, it's all wishful thinking at this point right now. All right, that's the video for this week. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. If you have questions or concerns, write your comment up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. K click the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And of course, if you'd like to make a donation, you may. Just hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with a dollar sign in it. And with that, we are done for this week. We will do it again next week, same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.